On behalf of our festival co-directors, Namita Gokhale and William Dalrymple, festival producer T. Bukarts, and the British Library, we welcome you to this session of JLF London at the British Library Virtual Festival, presented in partnership with the Aga Khan Foundation and our patron, the Murthy Family Foundation. Our magazine partner for this series is The Week, Journalism with a Human Touch. Our next session is The Partition Voices. Kavita Puri, Sam Dalrymple, and Vazira Fazila Yakubali Zamidar in conversation with Anchal Malhotra. Kavita Puri's father was 12 when he found himself one of the millions of Sikhs, Hindus, and Muslims caught up in the devastating aftermath of a hastily drawn border. For 70 years, like so many, he remained silent about the horrors he had seen. When her father finally spoke out, opening up a forgotten part of Puri's family history, she was compelled to seek out the stories. Determined to preserve these accounts of the end of empire and the difficult birth of two nations, Puri records a series of remarkable first-hand testimonies revealing Partition's enduring legacy. In Partition Voices, she helps break the silence and confronts the difficult truths at the heart of contemporary South Asia with Vazira, author of The Long Partition and The Making of Modern South Asia, Refugees, Boundaries, Histories. Sam Dalrymple, co-founder of Project Dastan, a peace-building initiative that aims to revisit partition memories and examine the impact of forced human migration through virtual reality. And Archil Malhotra, author of Remnants of a Separation, a history of the partition through material memory. Kavita Puri works in BBC Current Affairs and is an award-winning TV executive producer and radio broadcaster. Her landmark three-part series, Partition Voices for BBC Radio 4, won the Royal Historical Society's Radio and Podcast Award and its overall public history prize. Sam Dalrymple is the co-founder and operations le lead of Project Dastan. He's currently writing a book about the breakup of the Indian subcontinent from 1937 to 1971. Vazira is an associate professor of history at Brown University and author of The Long Partition and Making of South Asia, Refugees, Boundaries, Histories. Her recent writings on the partition of 1947 include why the partition is not an event of the past and exile, statelessness and the tenacity of nostalgia. Vasira would also like to thank Vasi Artists Association, Karachi, for their support. Archal Malhotra is an oral historian and author of Remnants of Partition. 21 objects from a continent divided. Shortlisted most recently for the British Academy's 2019 Nayaf Al-Rodham Prize for Global Cultural Understanding. All our sessions are available to view on london.jlflitfest.org. All our sessions will be available to view on our Facebook page, JLF Lit Fest, and on our YouTube channel, Jepper Lit Fest JLF. Do follow our handles, JLF Lit Fest on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get notified on the upcoming sessions. In case any of you drop off due to bandwidth issues, please log back on london.jlflitfest.org or find us on our Facebook and YouTube channels. Please do comment by typing in the comment section. And last but not the least, please help keep JLF London at the British Library a free festival by donating generously. Ladies and gentlemen, the partition voices. Kavita Puri, Sam Dalrymple, and Vazira in conversation with Archil Malhotra. Over to you, Archil. Thank you so much. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to this very interesting panel on the 1947 partition of India. I have with me three very different scholars sitting in different parts of the world at the moment as well. And what is really, I think, compelling about this event is that all three of them, actually all four of us, are oral historians. And we all challenge the widely accepted notion of what partition is. 
often we find that partition is painted with a very uniform brush of violence. And those of us who study it uh, in nuance and detail know that that isn't the case. And I'm really happy here that all of my three panelists have studied it through a very different and uh, very, very nuanced lens. Uh, so I'm excited to get started on this. One thing I want to say is that though this is going to be a conversation led by me, I would love my panelists to also ask questions because I think a lot of our subject matter is quite similar. So without further ado, let's talk about the beginning of all of your projects. Um, Kavita, Sam, Vazira, you've all written very different books on the partition of India, but I know personally that books about partition usually start from very personal anecdotes. So maybe we could go Vazira, Kavita, and then Sam. <clears throat> Sounds good. Oh. Um, um, thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to thank JLF and all of you for uh, including me in this conversation, and also Vassal, uh, the Artists Association and Karachi for orchestrating the space uh, for me to be here. Um, I am from a divided family. And for the last two weeks, my mother's sister in Pune, who is deaf and has been facing eviction there, um, and my mother here in Karachi has been on WhatsApp every day talking to her landlord in Pune, to brokers, in both Pune and Mumbai, to cousins, to friends, and friends' friends, trying to stop her eviction, trying to find her another apartment, trying to arrange the kinds of help that she needs. And the fact that we cannot go there to be with her, to help her, or that she cannot come to live with her sister for the remainder of her years, it's not just heartbreaking. It is heartbreaking, but it's not just heartbreaking. It is a political condition. It is a political condition that I need to understand. And that never goes away. And it's a political condition that needs to be undone. And that never goes away. So that is where my work comes from and my continual thinking of it partition. And I think it's quite aptly titled also the long partition because what you talk about was not just felt in 1947 or 71 or with any any event of such magnitude, but it continues on in the very everyday. As you say, they're on the phone right now. You know, this is very much their everyday. I think one thing that really got to me when I was doing my field research is divided families. The fact that when someone dies or when someone is born or someone is married, you can't cross the border. Um, Kavita, I obviously we've had tons of conversations about partition voices and in Britain it is not only well known but it has kind of redefined the landscape of the year 1947 conversations on empire and personal history, the importance of personal history and your book of course comes from an extremely personal place. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? So. I mean, like with so many people that study partition, uh, it, it was personal for me. My, my dad lived through that time, but never spoke about it. And I always tried to get him to talk to me about it, but he wouldn't. And as we approached the 70th anniversary in 2017, I thought not just of my dad, but all of that generation that came to Britain and what's really interesting is a lot of people who live through partition chose to having having become refugees to, chose to make a dual migration to Britain they they came to Britain with their stories of loss and trauma but they didn't talk about it and so silence has pervaded partition memories in Britain for so long and it, it kind of makes sense really that they didn't talk about it because they were just trying to get on with life, they were looking forward, they, they didn't have time to look at the past and then they had children like me who were born here and we didn't know that much about life back home so we didn't, we didn't ask those questions and it was, these are difficult things to talk about. They had seen awful things, um, maybe things had happened in their family, there was much dishonor, shame, it, it, these are hard things to speak of but within Britain you say you know you talk with great ease about partition partition is not is not something that is well known um 
you know, we're not taught it in schools. It, there is a silence, an institutional silence when it comes to partition and actually when it comes to empire. And so there was no public space for people to, to talk about these stories. And so, of course, my search was to, to hear my dad's story, but it was also to hear all those stories of people in Britain who had gone through that very traumatic time. These are, these are British people. They were, they were born subjects of the Raj. They're now British. And British people should know who they live side by side with because it, this is a story, you know, of Britain. And so that's, that's what compelled me. And, and just I thought if we don't capture them now, it's 70 years on, you know, they're so old. That's it, they're gone. They're gone forever from our family archives, but from the historical archives too. And that's why I chose first person testimony. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Sam, this of course is a very special event for you because uh, not only are you the co-founder of Project Aspan, but uh, you're also working on a new book which uh, yeah. I've had the fortune of reading the proposal. And again, it looks at partition through a completely different lens than any of us here as well. So what I want you to tell the audience is why Project Daskan, first of all, um, you know, you grew up in Delhi and uh, yeah. you're really immersed in the Indian landscape. So why Project Daskan and how during the lockdown did it inspire you to do something completely new on partition? Yeah. Um, so I first visited Pakistan in 2015 with remarkable ease, like, you know, applied for a visa in Delhi and it had always been this kind of other. I didn't really know what, I, what it was going to be like. Um, and I went and I was struck upon coming back with just, you know, how uh, the, the disbelief that, um, you know, everything about every single thing that I was saying about Pakistan. Oh, you know, like this happened, this happened. And there was just this complete disconnect between any dialogue between the two sides. Um, and when I was at university, um, we realized, you know, there was such a big diaspora from both India and Pakistan. Um, and everyone was talking about how their grandparents really wanted to um, cross that border. And we realized that with modern technology, um, we could find people's houses, um, childhood homes, childhood communities, without actually having to go there physically. And with a couple of people um, who could go across the border and with teams on all sides of the borders, um, we could make, we were making virtual reality experiences um, for the partition generation um, of where they came from across the border. Now, when lockdowns hit, um, that all got put on hold. As in Project Astan was still doing interviews, but it had to be, um, you know, it, 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 we couldn't travel anymore. We couldn't go out and find these um, places. We couldn't find the small pinned in Punjab or the Mohalla in Delhi that, you know, was never on Google Maps. There wasn't a street view for kind of, you know, this village in 10 hours outside of Lucknow. <laughs> um, and so whilst in lockdown, I began reading much more about uh, basically the geographical diversity I became very, very struck with this one simple thing, which um, was the story of partition in Tripura in India's northeast. And I felt that so much of what we hear about partition um, is very specific to the Punjab, the, the huge massacre um, and, you know, the, the exchange of population, essentially. Um, but as I think everyone has separately talked about, you know, that kind of stuff was quite specific to the Punjab. And the experience of partition in Bengal, um, in the northeast, um, in Sindh, and also in, in places like Tamil Nadu and, um, and Kerala. I know, Vazira, you end your book by talking about some um, Malayalis who end up in Karachi uh, and find this whole community of um, people from Kerala who are living in Karachi post-partition. And that kind of story, I found very little about these, these um, geographically varied partitions. And so my book is essentially talking about um, a the the different geographies of partition, the fact that it was affecting um, places in the northeast and in uh, Tamil Nadu, where a you know there was a sea border before you could get to anywhere across the British Empire, and places like Burma, um, Rangoon had seventy percent Indian population, Tamils, and all of that ended 
with partition, just like the land border, but in different ways. And so I wanted to talk a bit about that. And yeah, I think that's a good place to start. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, when you're talking, it reminds me of how Vizira actually starts her book by saying that in our part of the world, the piece of land that has no name disappears. Hmm. You know, and um, maybe I'm misquoting you, and maybe it's I'm just paraphrasing it, but that's kind of how it starts, right? And uh, Sam, I've seen you at work, I've seen you with Project Dastan, uh, and what I guess one of the things I love about the project so much is that it actually gives onus back to the people, it gives history back to the people. Mm -hmm. It They have ownership over where they came from because now they can see the streets and the names and everything. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about your book later, which um, I have many interesting questions about. <laughs> but actually, one question I have uh, for Vazia and Kavita, both, uh, in different aspects, because your geography that you talk about is very different. What about this sense of silence that exists within people? Um, Vazira, I know you did very specific kinds of interviews in the cities of Delhi and Karachi. And uh, Kavita, of course, you traveled across the UK talking to people. And you both talk about the silences and why there is silence. Right? Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that in regards to your research? Maybe K Kavita could start and then Vazira could follow. Um. It's really interesting, and I've been thinking about this a lot recently because somebody asks me, and this is the thing I'm, I'm asked the most when I do events like this, is often, interestingly, third generation, and I, I think it's the same for Sam. I think it's third generation that approaches Project Destin to, to, to yeah. connect their grandparents. And they ask, how do I interview my grandparents, sometimes my parents? And it's a funny thing, isn't it? Because like my dad, it was it was took seven decades for him to talk. And I always approached very, very gently with him because I knew it was something that, you know, I, I, I couldn't really broach and he didn't really want to talk. And what I have learned is that there are silences for so many reasons. Some of the things I talked about earlier, just because they were so busy getting on with their lives, but just because they didn't talk about it, doesn't mean that they didn't think about it. And I think that you can have conversations within families, which might be fragments of stories, um, and you don't have conversations within a wider sphere, because as I talked about the institutional silence, it doesn't, it doesn't really exist. But what I've also come to realize is that sometimes there are silences that you can't touch. And I found that particularly with women who talking about <clears throat> sexual violence and, and these silences are so profound and so deep that I don't think in Britain we will hear those, those stories now. But there's something else about silence which I've been thinking about and it's about borders and it's about memory and nostalgia. And when a border is drawn, I think that people think that, that stories and history and memories are erased and they're not. They still live in the person's head, even if they don't speak it. And that's why I'm such a proponent of people talking to family members, because if you don't hear their story, which by the way, is your family story, then it's gone forever. And that silence always, always remains. And I think that you should try and speak to, to family members about their story because otherwise that's it, it's gone. And, and then you don't know. And I would say particularly for British South Asians, knowing your history really matters because, you know, my tie to Britain is one generation only. That's quite fragile. And then I discover that I am not just you know, I have a connection to India. I have a connection to Pakistan too. And that, that, really, that really matters. And so I think we have to broach carefully. And I was really careful that we never spoke to any uh, interviewees who didn't want to be uh, spoken to. So we were always had generally an approach by a family member. But I think that we have to try and break those, those silences and we have to try and do that carefully and I think beyond the family in Britain it really really matters because this is British history and it's just about knowing who we live 
side by side with um and it's it's our connected history and so you know it, it matters you know, I think it's not just about the violence within the South Asian community, but also education within the larger British community as well. Right? Exactly. As, as we see uh, South Asian Heritage Month and stuff trying to start. Yeah, I think I think. Do you mind if I just quickly jump in here? But I think it's also um, what you talk about a lot in your book, Kavita, is um, it's not just you know British South Asians whose history it is. Um, you know. One in 20 people in the UK have some link to India, but some through blood, but some like my own grandfather, who yeah. was, you know, uh, pulled into the war, uh, into the war as a young officer and then was stationed out in Delhi. Um, and so I've now lived in um, Delhi for my whole life. My parents moved here more or less in the 80s. Um, but in that time, my grandfather never once visited us. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, we didn't really realize that like we kind of knew that he had some connection to it but it was only the day before his funeral that we found in um in some closet his photo album from 1947 and there was like a table plan where you know Jinnah and Nehru were both there and he was the young officer at the end of the table and he was he had an invitation to the flag raising of Pakistan and there's a photo of him outside the Kutub Minar 20 minutes from my house um but in these 30 years um he never visited our family once. And I think that's like a lot of his friends died during partition. He saw some horrific things aged 18. And I think that the silence persisted through even, you know, a white British family. Um, I think, and, I think found their it, home it, <laughs> it, it's really, it's so interesting you say that. And it's why I included British voices because I wanted to show that history. But when, when my Radio 4 series came out and the book came out, I, I talk about the breaking of silence within the British South Asian uh, community but you wouldn't believe how many British people then told me my dad was born in India or you know I had a, I had a grandfather and so I think also that the, the British population felt they had permission also to, to talk about their history and and share that that history too and it's it's interesting you also talk about um the the British Indian army or Br British army who, who witnessed a lot of the um, massacres of partition who came back and subsequently never talked about it either um, and that's the thing is because in Britain there is no conversation about empire or end of empire nobody whether British South Asians or, or British people feel that they they can speak with ease about it mm. yeah um, if I may jump into this conversation, it's about silence um, and people sharing their oral histories. I mean, that's something um, that began when it began in the um, with um, a number of you know, feminists, scholars beginning to um, speak to their mothers and grandmothers um, and then uh, grappling with those stories. A lot of that silence, I think, as you said, is, is it was painful to speak about, and it has taken many generations um, to grapple with it. But I would say this, that even, I mean, especially growing up in a divided family where um, you could never, I mean, every conversation at home but somehow had to grapple with this political fact, uh, which was painful and difficult, and a lot of people didn't speak publicly about it, uh, but there was a lot of at-home conversation about partition. Um, I think for all um, the, our families, um, there was this sense that there was a kind of loss, um, an unspoken loss, that was integral part of each of us, even though we are a generation, maybe two generations removed from 1947 per se, or for um, the long durée that it unfolded over. Uh, even though we are generations apart from it, that sense of loss, that there was something integral within us that was missing, that had been taken away, that something had been denied to us, was very much deeply felt, deeply experienced. And this sense of loss, I think, is something that I feel is really important 
to hold on. A lot of people will say, you know, stop talking about partition enough. I mean, you're saying that there's still a lot of silence, but there's a lot of people who also say um, they're fed up with uh, this uh, partition memory business, uh, remembering uh, this terrible past. Enough has been said. We're telling more and more stories of the same event. We need to move on. We need to stop mourning this past. We need to stop mourning this past and we need to sort of get um, settled with the facts on the ground. Uh, there's much to celebrate. Three nation states are a reality. We uh, need to move on and that this is a past that needs to be left in the past. Uh, we've done enough storytelling about it. Now it's sort of, uh, in, we are in repetition mode. Uh, more and more stories. What, what is the new insight that they can offer? But it's this loss, I think. It's a sense of mourning that is so important to hold on to. But because this past is not in the past. Because this past is not in the past. It lives with us, in us, over time and over generations. And my own refusal to get let go of this loss, it's taken me a really long time, really. I mean, I, I, I began work, it's been 25 years of collecting stories and um, the visual record, um, of um, the years, what I, th I think of as not something that ended in 47 or even 765 or 71, but one that, that sort of goes on. Partition is something that goes on and on and on. And, um, and, and I think holding on to this idea, the sense of loss, refusing to accept that partition is something that happened, it's over, uh, we need to just get past it is perhaps the same reason why Gandhi refused partition. And I think, uh, I just want to articulate that, because I think that's, that's there's, there's, this, um, there's this way in which we can give a lot of specificity to 47 um, in terms of um, the, 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 the many different experiences of different geographies that Sam was talking about. Um, the many uh, other interlocutors of this experience, including the British, as well as others um, that uh, we, we draw upon, we must draw upon to think with. But here's why I think Gandhi refused to acquiescence to partition. Because ultimately partition is a colonial concept not just a divide and rule colonial concept, but it's also a European conception of the nation state that gets imposed upon us. And it is a concept that says that the multi-religious plural worlds where modalities of living together with differences had been forged over centuries are now suddenly untenable, mm -hmm. are now suddenly untenable. And it declares that some differences are so incommensurate that it requires, it demands that we cleave these shared worlds apart, no matter what the cost and no matter how much destruction and violence it takes. And so when we think with this concept, this, when we, we recuperate these stories, when we tell them, insist on telling these stories of partition, right? And it's, it's not simply a matter of breaking the silence. Uh, it's not simply telling the stories so that we can pass them down to the generations because we are living with them, whether they are told, whether they're spoken or not. It is in a way to recuperate this plurality that was once lived by uh, those who still carry its pain, its burden, but right? was lived and to refuse the incommensurability that partition demanded. And we must continue as such to do this work, be it through Dastan or the writing of different uh, texts. Um, the, it, it, it's striking to me that, you know, all of you are doing, continue, continue to do this work. And, and I, I, I get students who are even, you know, they're, they're even more removed um, from um, 47 uh, per se. And yet this sense of loss that lives mm. with them, that leads mm. them 
to examine and explore it um, is this loss of a multi-religious world that was rendered untenable. I want to say one more thing because one of the things, of course, my work has been about, has been doing oral history work with largely Muslims, uh, both in Iran and Pakistan. And partition affects Muslims. We live with it in a particular way, which I think needs to be articulated because it affects everyone for that reason. Let's just say that, that in this plural world, this multi-religious world, one might have imagined Muslims were an integral part of the very formation of the plural ideas of India. But in acquiescing to partition, it meant that they then became outsiders to it. Mm. Anti-colonial struggles fought hard against precisely this kind of colonial idea. Mm. This political conception of the world, which one could say is an imperial conception of the world. And even though we um, turn to the Indian constitution that writes a constitution in spite of this, right? But acceding to partition, this newfound incommensurability meant that everything that appeared Muslim, its cleaving apart was set in motion. Mm -hmm. And so partitions were not, were taking place within, mm -hmm. within nation states, uh, ongoing. Um, and there was, um, if, if this incommensurability uh, of Muslims um, in, within the idea of India was put in crisis. In Pakistan, there was a dereliction almost immediately in trying to figure out what it meant to be Muslim without the plurality of the worlds in which it had been formed. You know, the plural worlds were, were integral to any conception of what it means to be Muslim. Yeah. And this had also been being taken away. So where the Muslims stayed where they were mm -hmm. or migrated uh, mm -hmm. with space, um, in both cases, uh, their worlds were over time. Now this, uh, this in incommensurability has implications, I think, for all kinds of thinking about all kinds of poor lives, mm -hmm. poor worlds uh, that we um, must, in some way continue um, to, um, uh, demand and accountability. Mm. Well, I think one of the things that was really clear in your book is that you make a distinction between migration and displacement, you know, within the Muslim population as well. And you go very much into detail about things like property, evacuee property, uh, land ownership of that land, longing for land left behind, and also what what the state did just post partition with fermenting the sense of citizenship and identity, which I think is is fascinating and um, it's very interesting how you know last year I got into an argument with someone. In fact, at it wasn't an argument. I shouldn't say that. It was at the British Library. It was at an event at the British Library, and someone told me that partition was done and dusted with, which I'm sure all of us on this panel have heard multiple times. And it was very interesting because the revocation of uh, article uh, of Kashmir had just happened a few days earlier. And she said to me that, you know, young people like you, partition is done. I don't know why you keep harking about the past. You keep digging up old graves. You should write on Kashmir. Mm -hmm. And I, and it, it, it just clicked in my head that you can't write about an event without understanding the origin of that event. And Kashmir is just one example of, of you know, the links that have been drawn since partition. So uh, I know the long partition is, is the, the book um, I wrote and it, it, it was determined at the time. It's, it's been more than a decade since that book came out and was determined at the time to give that kind of specificity. Mm -hmm. It has all this specificity, right, of what happened because that question of what happened was seen something that still needed a lot of accounting for. Sorry, this is the Karachi, yeah, of course, yeah. traffic. <laughs> um, it still needed an accounting for, but now I my in, in the decade since, mm. what I have I feel like I I have 
a little bit more clarity and a little bit more courage to say that partition didn't begin in uh, June on June third. Or um, I mean, we we're always looking for a date when uh, when partition seems inevitable, right? As 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 the origin for uh, or as origin for, and I know Sam you've chosen 1937. I don't know Kavita where where you begin with telling the story. Where do we begin with telling the story? Because it is something that has a history in many different geographies. Uh, across the 20th century, when the nation state idea, a uh, European conception of the nation state, is then globalized. Um, and uh, you see, uh, this is a particular conception that is, gets imposed in, in um, the Indian subcontinent as a solution of sorts. Um, I don't know where we would be, go for a beginning, mm -hmm. but what, what we also know is that it's like, it, it's something that demands continuous reproduction. Mm -hmm. And it demands continuous reproduction. It's an unending process. If it's, if it's not in one space, it's in another. If it's not in one life, it's in another. And we see this, Kashmir being one, but then the citizenship laws becomes another. Right. The, the forms of everyday violence right. like escalating. If right. escalating. Uh, India, I mean, what I would say, Vizier, is I, I completely agree. I think, and that's the thing, is people think partition is a historical event. Well, I mean, it is a historical event. It happened on a date in 1947. But it's so present when you speak to people. And, and that is one of the things that I took from my interviews. And I, and I know, Antra and Sam, we've talked about this, but when you interview people who lived through that time, they don't talk about, borders, about division, about partition. They just talk about their land, hmm. wherever that land was. And if you ask them today, you know, who are you? Where are you from? Hmm. They will always start with the land of their hmm. birth. And that is the thing that I took away from all of it, is that absolute visceral attachment to the land of their birth, even if they'd never been back in over 70 hmm. years, it is absolutely who they are. And Bazira, you're right. That sense of attachment has persisted through the ages. You know, Angela and I always talk about this. I, I feel a really strong attachment to Lahore. I have never been there. It, it is, it is, I'm attached to a memory an inherited memory from my father by the way he never went back after he left as well but that is very much in me and i have passed that on to my children now i don't know how many generations that will persist for but but right now it's very alive but but then there is a counter to that that is also very alive which is the national narratives on the indian subcontinent which strangely or not strangely, is quite counter to the partition generation and counter to the stories that they tell you. And so I fear that when that generation is dead and they give you a much more complex view of what, what India was, British India was like, uh, how, as you say, Vizira, people live side by side with all their differences and all that messiness. They, they live like that. You know, your land could be more important than your religion. You, you shared more in perhaps language or culture or traditions. When they die, they can't then counter the national narratives that is now being perpetuated, which is why it's important to record their, their memories and their... Mm -hmm and their testimonies, because after that, other people will try and rewrite that history. Mm. I want to Sam oh, in actually, um, Sam, I've been thinking a lot of public memory of partition and also thinking about your new proposal that shows a completely different side of partition. It talks of many different partitions and you, as Vazira said, you begin with 1937 and you extend all the way to 71 to the liberation. Um, can you give us a sense of these different frontiers that you're looking at? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, one of the things that increasingly struck me, particularly when I began researching the Northeast, was that for the Northeast, 
this was the second partition within a decade. Only in 1937 were they cut off from Burma. And that was very much to do with the Burmese nationalist movement. Because Burma was completely part of British India, as were places like um, Aden in Ye modern day Yemen. Huge swathes of Yemen were part of British India. Yemen was part of Bombay province. Um, and a lot of the Gulf states, Qatar, Oman, um, UAE, uh, were treated by the Raj as uh, princely states. They were all given awards of the British order. They all had representatives in the British Raj in New Delhi. And with 37 was the first time um, that a kind of huge land border struck off um, a big part of that. And so you get, um, you know, the, the, a border going through the Naga Hills and you get Naga communities in both the northeastern India and northwestern Burma. And you get the Rohingya, who are this community um, of who speak a kind of dialect of Bengali, who were um, protesting for Pakistan, who suddenly are, are deprived of Pakistan. You know, they're, they're on the wrong side of, uh, of that border. Um, and... The same year, uh, 37, you also get uh, the Yemeni bit uh, lobbed off and turned into its own little colony as well. Um, and so for me, it's, it wasn't so much that the kind of partition with Pakistan became inevitable during 37, but that, you know, it was the first major cut. Kind of, another one you could say was maybe Afghanistan, but that was 100 years earlier. And it was at best a kind of vaguely protected territory when the British went in there. It, this was, you know, a full part of in, what India was. And Gandhi and Tagore all go on holidays to Rangoon, you know, stuff like that. And so um, I, I talk about five partitions. First, the partition of Burma and Aden. Secondly, the Great Partition that we are all um, know much more about. Um, third, the partition of princely India, because two thirds of what's now India wasn't ever ruled by the British at all. It was independent kingdoms. Um, and actually only 19% of the modern Indo-Pakistani border was ever drawn by Radcliffe. The rest was drawn by the decisions of Maharajas, of Nawabs, of Nizams. And obviously the, the idea that it was gonna be separate states was created by the British. But I find that the, the agency of these characters has somehow disappeared in the 70 years since. And so for example, Jodhpur state almost joined Pakistan. We would have a very different shaped country had that happened. Um, Junagad state did. Uh, um, and then Indian army went in. I, we all know what happened in Kashmir. So that's the third partition. The fourth one was the separation of the Gulf states, which, you know, Pak Gwadar, which is now in Pakistan, um, was Omani. It belonged to Oman. And across the Gulf, you know, there were huge Indian communities because they were all princely states. Um, and that was all separated between 48, uh, 47, sorry, and 56. And they all became independent states thereafter. And then the final one, of course, is when Pakistan itself is um, turned into two, it, like when Bangladeshi independence basically happens, when two, two nations emerge there. And that's the last major moment of border shifting, really, in, with the exception of Sikkim being joining India. It's the first, it's the last time that there's a division. Um, and so for me, that's why I think I chose 37 and 71. It kind of made sense, 34 years, where five different types of divisions happen, um, most of which we kind of, Get lost somehow. But unfortunately, um, a lot of the repercussions of which have been felt today, as the well. Rohingya crisis. Only this after this afternoon, there was um, two Burmese generals um, who, you know, basically admitted to the Hague about the war mm -hmm. crimes that they committed in the army. And now that whole Rohingya crisis is very much dates from uh, the Burmese partition. Uh, where you know these were considered Indians or Pakistanis, but not Burmese. And Burma, over throughout its dictatorship, um, came up with a list of native communities who didn't come from India, essentially, um, so that they could determine who was native to Burma and who'd come over during the colonial period. Um, and and you know, these, we have and so, five minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm being sent messages. Quick question of Sam, which is which is like you're thinking about when you say five partitions, in terms of territorial partitions, right? When borders are drawn and territories carved up. But in each of these uh, stories, um, um, you know, there's there's all the ways in which uh, the lists that are drawn up as we're speaking of Burma and the ethnic cleansings that they 
that they um, set in motion, uh, these become far, um, uh, they, they proceed and continue. Um, this is the ways in which the territorial drawing on the map uh, becomes so much more, right? Becomes so much more. And in a way, the oral history work in that sense um, it needs to be continuous because it is a, a continuously unfolding uh, sets of violence and, and displacement of the and, and this is something that's surprising me. It's just, you know, we think of, as you said, like, you know, part, partition histories having been recorded already. Uh, but the, the fact that Burma was even part of uh, the Indian subcontinent until a decade before partition um, surprises so many people that I meet, mean, even though all the maps that you see of of British India have Burma. It's there from the beginning of the Raj. It's not like, and, and you know, it's visually there all the time, but everyone thinks, oh yeah, but it was just kind of, you know, maybe administratively, but no, you know, there are numerous Burmese dynasties that occupied Assam. Uh, the Ahom language in Northeast India that was part of Assam was a dialect of Thai. So, you know, the, the connections between Southeast Asia and South Asia, I mean, all these different nation states come into being already. And so we forget the levels of connection that existed, not even just pre-colonialism, but during colonialism. Why are there so many Indians, Pakistanis, Bangladeshis, or De Desis, because they weren't, didn't subscribe to any of these nationalities, but in Kenya, in South Africa, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it was a very connected world. Yeah. Um, and I think interrogating that is important. Questioning yeah. your grandma is important. We have been cut off officially. Um, <laughs> I know the thing with partition panels is that they can go on forever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are things of mutual interest. But um, I want to thank all of you for joining in from wherever you are at the moment. Um, you know, Sam and Kavita, of course, we speak a lot. But Bazira, it's been a pleasure to have you on the panel yeah. and meet you this way <laughs> and hear you talk about your work. And of course, thank you so much for being a part of JLF London. And uh, yeah, over to over to JLF now. Thank you, thank you so much, Archil, and thank you, everyone. Lovely speakers, Kavita, Sam, and Vazira. Thank you, thank you very, very much. And of course, thank you all for watching and being such a great audience. We would also like to thank our partners, the Aga Khan Foundation UK, and our patron, the Murthy Family Foundation, for supporting us. We hope that you will stay with us for all our remaining sessions today and will join us tomorrow for a whole day of fabulous sessions. Our next session that will begin shortly is In Search of the Anarchy, Treasures of the East India Company from the India Office Collection of the British Library. William Dalrymple and Malini Roy, introduced by Sanjay Roy. <laughs>